Uh, welcome to another episode of Money in the Bank with Frank. Uh, today we have James Burkett from uh, an institutional crypto manager. I wanted to make sure that we get a good uh, disclaimer on this one. This recording is for informational purposes only. Any views and statements expressed in this recording are based on internal research subject to, subject to change. It does not constitute investment advice. Your capital is at risk and past performance is not an indication of future performance. Uh, welcome for another episode. I thought that uh, with all the news going on, it seems like uh, the institutional crypto space is alive and well, but no one seems to be watching what's going on. We still have on CNBC quotes for uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, but no one's talking about anything other than you know the most recent shakeup, which was like Kraken uh, staking. Uh, I don't even know. Is it a verdict? Is it a settlement? Like what? I believe it started as a Wells notice, mm -hmm. um, and because it's an SEC suit, obviously it's a civil suit. It's not a regulatory change. Mm -hmm. The SEC, the Kraken settled the SEC uh, permanently to say, "Hey, we're going to pay thirty million dollars, and we'll never have another staking program." Which I think, in the larger scheme of things, is a pretty big settlement to say that, "Hey, we'll never do something like this again." Mm -hmm. um, with any kind of proof of stake blockchain, that's a that's an integral part of how the system works. And mm -hmm. so to say, hey, we'll never do this again, and the the first inning is kind of a kind of a big statement on, on their part, which you know we can speculate all we want about it, but that's a, I would say that's my my take on it for for now. Yeah, and I think that it's kind of important, you know, anyone that wants to actually do some research and, and figure out proof of work, proof of stake. But in a nutshell, proof of work is like. Bitcoin, right? It's like, you know, the machines actually, this is the less efficient way. The machines are crunching all the data and you have to prove that you solved the puzzle, right? And then with proof of staking, you're putting up the coins as collateral to some degree saying, this is how you know that I'm doing the work. I'm putting up capital or I'm putting up my my tokens, right? Is that how? Yeah, I would that's say all? that's similar. I mean, we, we, that, this is pro that's probably a, a two-hour session in and of itself. Right. With, so I'm uh, just trying to give some with all the uh, the, the details of it. Um, I, I think simplistically that that illustrates it. Where uh, you're looking at Bitcoin, which is a proof of work network, which you mm. know you have miners solving very very complex math problems to get the next block reward. Um, Proof of stake doesn't work any differently, but for the fact that it's not external problems being solved, it's chain verification, and you're putting up. Uh, rather than millions and millions in mining machines, you're putting up your tokens as collateral, your value as collateral, and there are limitations yeah. to that. But simplistically speaking, that's exactly correct. Yeah. So give us, give me your testimony. What's your like? How did you get involved in this? I mean, you're obviously well educated, experienced, money management material. How did you go from traditional finance to Absolutely. Decent. So I, I worked as an investment banker in financial services. Uh, you know, my old boss used to say we were an inch wide and a mile deep. Uh, so <laughs> anything financial services we touched, if that was, you know, community and regional banks, those mortgage companies, uh, spec fin, fintech. Um, so we saw the sausages made there. And it's not an efficient sauce. It's it's not an efficient process. I mean, you look at these guys, FIS, the FI serves of the world. Like we're using COBOL technology. Um, bank mainframes are run on technology that was built in the '80s, and mm -hmm. you know, really look to improve that. Did I think crypto was the, uh, you know, the solution or the the coup de gras there? No, not really. Um, but you keep following it. You keep following it. Um, after the ICO boom, it started to get more interesting. You started to see things that really resembled what a bank mainframe looks like and and how to do this better. Um, and that's where I really kind of you know, started to peel back the onion casually and then now professionally for about three years. And so mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> after the uh, investment banking world, I spent time as a CFO of a couple of fintechs, a couple of crypto protocols. We raised money from the you know, largest Silicon Valley institutional investors, largest VCs. Uh, we grew a protocol to you know, over 500 million in assets in a week. Wow. Uh, very, very, very quickly. So, you know, look at community banks. It takes them five, 10, 15 years to, to reach 500 million in assets. And it took us five, 10, 15 days. Mm -hmm. um, so you really see the power of crypto with that. And that that was enough to to push me over the edge and say, hey, this is something I want to spend most of my time um, you know, focused on. And so mm -hmm. uh, in 2022, I founded my current company called uh, Delos. Uh, Delos is a traditional uh, hedge fund that operates in the crypto markets. I would say we look 
we look a lot like a growth equity investor mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. tools of a long short hedge fund. So we will take leverage, we will buy options, we use OTC desks and prime brokers, um, and we operate in this wild west space that is crypto. Um, mm-hmm. What's unique about the space specifically is that if you look at traditional markets, there's uh, there's really one advantage in illiquid markets or mm-hmm. one advantage in liquid markets. Uh, you're talking about trading off information asymmetry for liquidity. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you go to the public markets, uh, Ken Griffin and Citadel have all the information before you have it, and Mm -hmm. that information asymmetry exists for three seconds. You know, you you pick your number there. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can flip to the real estate market, and there's information asymmetry in the real estate market. Mm -hmm. If you're a commercial broker, a commercial real estate owner, if you're multifamily, whatever it is, there's tons of information asymmetry, but it's Mm -hmm. not liquid. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really, really hard to transact, and it's really, really slow. It's like and BlackRock, like those issues they're having with those REITs, yeah, right? Exactly. You look at mm-hmm. you look at the Blackstone private REIT. Blackstone, it's not. It's right, really yeah. not. Yep, yep. E- it's really not easy to move those assets around. Um, mm-hmm. And so for me, being uh, it's, it's a weird, Dallas is a long short hedge fund mm-hmm. um, operating in the crypto space. It's the best of both worlds. We have information asymmetry. We can work harder, do better diligence, have institutional knowledge, proprietary knowledge, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can do our job better than our competition. Uh, and it's in a liquid fashion. I'm not a, a VC who has to hold something on my books for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, we're open-ended fund. We, we don't have locked capital. Um, it provides a ton of flexibility. If I like you know, what our portfolio is doing for the next three quarters, that's fantastic. And if mm-hmm. there's a black swan event on the horizon, I'm not locked into it. I can hedge that. I can do whatever I want with it. And when it's time to step on the gas, I can go borrow money and I can go long, long, long it. So I get kicked. I get a kick out of (coughs) different companies by just looking at their name. If you look at their name, you kind of get an idea of what what, what's their strategy? What are they committing to? Yeah, I looked up Delos, right? Delos or Delos? Delos. Delos. So transparency, right? It's funny. It's a, yeah, it's a, the the three things that I've heard it's it's a uh, the uh, villain firm in the show Westworld so that's that actually is not what it is <laughs> not what it's named after uh, but it's a it's an island in the Greek Isles uh, mm-hmm. but it also means unconcealed or apparent in Greek and to me that was the most obvious thing about crypto mm-hmm. uh, you spend time with it you realize it's not a bunch of you know crazy people moving money around on the internet you realize that this is a better mousetrap I mean for me the uh, the aha moment was going through. Uh, I was I got married in 2020, and uh, preparing for our wedding, and I had to send money to a vendor that was making specialty things my wife had picked out in Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. and so for a wire from a U.S. bank mm-hmm. for them to clear for them to actually sell it to get the the money, um, it took longer than for them to send a series of towels from Eastern Europe to our home at the time we were living in the Bay Area. So the fact that an electronic Bite can't clear as fast as someone can send, you know, fifty pounds of towels across the world uh, was a bit of an aha moment. Like, hey, guys, maybe there's a maybe there's a better way to do this. And so, that that was one of the you know, anecdotal pieces that really kicked it off. But to me, it's it's just obvious. Like, we look at companies; mm-hmm. um, they happen to live on the blockchain, and mm-hmm. you know, public investors get quarterly financials. We get weekly, monthly, daily, whatever financials we want, and we build them ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting if you take a look at the old infrastructure of of the financial system in general you take a, like on the retail side we have the swift system you've got mm-hmm. you've got the dtc system you've got the acat system you've got i don't even know what zell and all these payment processors do but it's you know at the time it's like you had to have all these different systems cuz you didn't know what europe used you didn't know what specific exchanges or countries used and so they would come up with different systems but everybody has communication system called the interweb <laughs> well it's, you know it's like maybe the, you should upgrade <laughs> well, one of the uh, i have two points single for ledger it. come on it's not two, that hard right two, two points for you on that one in that <clears throat> I, I think a lot of people in the crypto digital asset space want to poo-poo traditional finance look it works it, it doesn't work as well as we'd like it to but it works mm-hmm. um the u.s has a really really high functioning financial system um but people have been trying to settle transactions for, on the weekend for, I don't know, 100 years. Um, we still can't do it. Uh, you can get money through Zelle. You can get money through Venmo, whatever you want. But it actually doesn't settle. And so that's why we have big mm. weekend problems. Anyone who lived through you know, GFC at Goldman, at any of the big shops, like they spent the weekend trying to figure out who owed who overnight. Um, that was a big problem because we can't clear transactions instantly. And mm-hmm. that's not, again, a panacea. There are issues with that. There are issues with low liquidity times. We can 
you know, go through all these different things. Mm -hmm. um, but we still do things in an incredibly inefficient manager, uh, manner. Uh, yesterday, uh, a company uh, called Siemens in, in Germany cleared mm -hmm. a bond issuance on a public blockchain platform. Their alternative was doing it on paper, with paper. And that, that's, that's sort of where we're at right now, guys. It's, uh, it's been scotch taped together for so long that uh, we didn't need to fix it. It worked. We pushed through it. These guys were making enough money. They never cared. Um, yeah. No one cared about infrastructure in 2008. And then from 2012 to 2020, what were they dealing with? They were dealing with politicians yelling at them, with the CFPB, with, you know, what are the next um, C car requirements we're going to have? What mm -hmm. are the next capital requirements going to have on Dodd Frank? You know, am I over 10 billion? Am I, is Durbin relevant, relevant to me? Um, all of these different things that banks had to worry about. Mm -hmm. And so infrastructure got put on the back burner. Um, and, and that's, that's sad and that's unfortunate, but what it, mm -hmm. what it looks like today, um, contrasting, I would say crypto to what traditional finance looks like is that crypto to me is really like a container ship. Mm -hmm. If you go to any port in the world, mm -hmm. containers all have the same dimensions. They have the same height, weight, all of these restrictions. So I can go to long beach, I can go to Tokyo, I can go to Cape town and it's all the same stuff. Uh, if you look at the traditional finance, um, I guess infrastructure, we have triangular containers, we have hexagonal containers, we have round containers, and each of those requires a different ship, a different truck, and it's mm -hmm. just really, really inefficient. We have a lot of the, the support for this, but it's mm -hmm. clunky, it's inefficient. Um, and so having a homogenous, everything works together, everything clicks together, that's the, that's the money Legos that the crypto and that DeFi is to me. Yeah, and it seems like <clears throat> there's so many different companies that are trying to solve that single payer system, that single point of sale, single point of contact. Like you know, one of the disruptor fifties from last year, I think, was uh, Flexport, right? And okay. uh, and I couldn't understand. I was like, it's a container company, but it isn't really, right? And that just brought, popped into my head because I was like, okay, so how are they making it more efficient? I didn't realize how much all of those uh, original companies and how. They didn't know when the container was actually going to make it to the port, which wasn't going to be able to fit on the ship, which wasn't going to be able to stack in the right place. And that's, you know, again, staying with the the, the uh, alliteration, it's like it it makes sense that you would have the same infrastructure worldwide oh, absolutely. For, for electronics and for, for clearing money that you would for something as basic as shipping goods, right? <laughs> I, it's, there, there are so many funny parallels. And I, I think people people look at these and say, you know, what's the next thing we're going to fix? What's the first thing we can fix? And unfortunately, that's that's a little difficult. Mm -hmm. So you say, hey, I want to fix, fix banking infrastructure. Well, like, that, that's an oligopoly of two to three guys. Mm -hmm. um, and they have hundreds of billions of dollars at stake keeping it the way that it is. So that's a really, really hard business to change. A company mm -hmm. I was a CFO of uh, tried to change how mortgage companies process mortgage loans and try mm -hmm. to make that process more efficient. That mm -hmm. is a oligopsony. You have really two or three big buyers and a ton of little different sellers. That's a really hard business to change. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what financial services today. And so that's a long dated uphill battle. Where I think there's more opportunity right now is sort of brownfield and greenfield opportunities. You look at carbon credits. You know, If you want to trade carbon credits, you call up your broker and you're trading a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really interesting avenue for people to use blockchain, for people to use digital assets. Um, a lot of people are talking about tokenizing real estate, tokenizing stocks. I'm, I'm less excited about that. Mm -hmm. I think it will come. It should come. It should probably be more efficient. But again, that's not the zero to one step that I think that digital asset markets can really, really help with. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I would maybe taking a step back too is uh, we talk a lot to a lot of investors and say, well, you know, these aren't currencies. They are not currencies. You have one one cryptocurrency. It's probably Bitcoin. Um, we can argue about that. That's not really <laughs> that's not really why I'm here. It doesn't that doesn't that doesn't do anything for me. Um, yeah. And I think that's fantastic. I, I think it's it's it really kicked off kind of a revolution. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have a, a dog in that fight, so to speak, um, right. where the, what we like to invest in, what we like to focus on is businesses that live on the Internet. Mm -hmm. This is no different than how you know, Facebook, Google were, were interesting ideas years ago. But it's, mm -hmm. it's businesses that live on the blockchain. They're enabled by cryptography. And the world is your oyster at that point. Makes a lot of sense. If you actually take a look at uh, historically at different companies and just thinking about this, you've got companies like IBM, who originally was like – I, dating myself, 
made <laughs> typewriters, right? Yeah. Didn't even want to go into computers. Literally, like, inner family fight to try to get them into the computer business. But if they would have gotten in there faster, they could have maybe quoted the market. But they didn't want to. They are they were doing just fine as they were, right? Um, so that's that Greenfield analogy. Is like, you know, who, who came up and started fighting and figuring it out? It's like, well, f- someone's going to do it. You, get, you had all these different fights over like Dell, Micron, you know, who was the one with the, the, the cow that, you know, let's say someone's going to figure it out. If you don't, they just need to know that the tool exists and then eventually they'll figure it out. Right. I think that, um, I was actually hoping for, which it's funny that you said the mortgage market, because I just hate like when you're doing closings and I have to help clients on closings all the time, title insurance. Why does that industry even exist? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's never needed to innovate, um, and I, I don't want to pretend to be a, mm-hmm. an, an expert on on title insurance or on escrow. Um, I just see the blockchain as a solution to things like that. It's like, well, title insurance exists in case there's a problem with who owned it or owned it in the past. Well, something like blockchain, you know, if they put it on the system, you see the single transaction happen. It was passed. Provenance is assured. <laughs> Immut- and immutability a, is a good thing. Yeah, and yeah. it's not a percentage of the purchase price of the property. You know, it's like whatever. But. It, it it's it's a very interesting. I mean, escrow is another a really interesting one to me. In that you can talk to, I mean, a, an entry level computer science student, and they could write uh, essentially an escrow contract uh, on a for a blockchain protocol, whether that's on, on the Bitcoin network, whether that's in Solidity for Ethereum, um, and you're done. That industry is over and done. Um, it, it only is relevant because it's attached to your First Republics, it's attached to your Union Bank or your your local community bank where they can provide that service. But it's a wildly expensive service for, for what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, smart contracts fix that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a yes, no, if statement kind of a question. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that, that's where we are. And, and these things take time. It's mm-hmm. You're not going to displace a massive industry of people overnight. Um, I think when you look at escrow a title for some commercial properties, there's a little bit more hair, there's a little bit more nuance. But if you're talking about mortgages in a Mm -hmm. new housing development that was recently entitled, um, I have no idea what you're paying for at that point. Um, If you bought the land, entitled the land, did all, you know, went from blue top to your home, um, what's what's going on there, guys? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just, yeah, it's, I, I start thinking about the new, best interesting thing and i'm wondering how you feel about crypto and this the news cycle and like is ai gonna overshadow the crypto craze ai is funny i mean look we're what what's so unique about my job is that i'm actually not sitting there buying you know the next the next big thing like we mm-hmm. we're not we don't take product risk we don't do pre-product we try not to do pre-revenue um, we focus on businesses that are a little bit established already and, you know, mm-hmm. k- kick them up to the next level or support them to the next level. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not something where we're deciding, hey, these guys have a really good idea. Let's see if it works. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll take a wait and see approach. Yeah, I, I not the traditional venture capitalists throw money at it, you know, at a, at a lower valuation and see I, if it works. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that are far better than that than I am. Mm-hmm. Um I've you know been an angel investor and a seed investor in my day, and you know I got all my money back, and that's what I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> despite the success of some of these companies, I think there are far more skilled people to do it than I, mm-hmm. and you know that's that's really not what people are paying us to do. I think mm-hmm. you know I can look at these things and say, hey, you have an idea, and you want me to purchase a share of your idea at a billion dollars pre money. I think that's uh, I'll I'll miss the opportunity, mm-hmm. and when that goes 100x and is the next big thing, is the next chat GPT. Like that's fine. We'll take that loss. We're not trying to hit taking that level of risk into everything out of the park. We're trying to hit doubles, triples because we can do it fairly easily. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have to take the big swing and you know strike out on occasion. Yeah, that's a <coughs> interesting thing. Uh, people misrepresent risk. Uh, I had a very wealthy person point out to me uh, a long time ago, a long, long time ago, that you get to a certain level and it all becomes about fixed income. It's like, I, I, you know, you could be in the get rich camp or you could be in the stay rich camp, right? Okay. You know, and, and uh, it's the suckers that are playing in the risky, the riskiest assets because, you know, they're looking for that lottery ticket win in a lot of cases. Uh, when the truth of the matter is, and I have to set this expectation up front with most of my clients, uh, is that you're giving me the money so that I can 
hopefully beat inflation. I'm not here to try to make 30% a year. I mean, hey, if I did, that'd be great. I mean, we know that the stock market is a uh, net positive. It's not gambling because it's a positive number, not like Vegas, which you know, at its best odds is is against you. But you know, your real job, like what you're really looking to do with your money, is just to beat inflation. Your real job is to have your job or to take that money, that asset that you have, and to reallocate it into something that's going to generate more. But not necessarily. Betting on red or black. <laughs> it, it, it's so funny you mentioned that. Like that, that's that, that's something that we try to espouse and really really push to our investors is that look, you, you, crypto as an industry today is about a trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. So it's smaller than most or than the largest public companies in the United States. Mm-hmm. It's a very small cottage industry today. Yeah. Um, there's a Deloitte study that talks about uh, the crypto industry having uh, between a 23 and 30 percent CAGR through 2033. That's incredible. Just stay out of the way. Just let it grow. You, let, don't 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 lose your shirt. Um, yeah. The guys who were down ninety percent last year are banging the table. Hey guys, we 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 printed a hundred percent month in uh, January of twenty twenty three. That's fantastic. You were down ninety percent in twenty twenty two. So your thirteen month performance is eighty one percent down. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's you, you got to stay alive. You got to mm-hmm. stay in the game. Um, this is an incredibly high risk asset. I think people mm-hmm. look at it and say, "Hey, look at all the money these people made. Mm-hmm. Um, look at the outsized risk they took. What was the sharp on what they did?" If someone doesn't have a clear sense of what the sharp may have been or approximately was there, mm-hmm. um, that that's that's not real. Anyone who is pitching you that their fund did a hundred x in this year and this year and this year and this year, well, it's that's that's not how investments work. And you know. You can have really, really great performance, but you want to have really consistent performance. I think it's uh, this Howard Marks who talks about you never want the best performing manager because at some year they'll be the best, some year they'll be the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, and we try to kind of focus on that. You know, mm-hmm. we can we we had a really successful January. Uh, it was below where we think a lot of our peers were, um, mm-hmm. and that's okay. We're not we're not trying to be the best best fund out there every single month. Um, it, this is a long-term game. We're we're in this for the long haul, and you know I don't need to beat everybody every single month. That's the, that's not the game. It's it's being here in ten years and saying, wow, this is a really fantastic journey. One of the thing, one of the challenges I think that you have more so than even uh, I have. You know, usually, institutions have all the coolest toys, right? You know, you, you, they institutions have like all the, the 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 fun tricks to try to get all the additional research and. Um, on my side of the table, normally it's like you've got maybe you've got one, maybe two. I'm lucky enough to have four different platforms that, that I can manage money on. But generally, you pick one client, one account. So I'm with TD for most of mine, and then I've got Fidelity. None of those are clients, but you know, or uh, investors. But if they feel like throwing some money my way, feel free. Um, but literally, you know, you uh, as an institutional uh, manager dealing in the crypto space. There have been so many blow-ups and so many financial institutions that actually represent that they were doing one thing, and then you find out they're doing a lot of things, and none of the ones that you really wanted them to do. I know that Texas, I think, <laughs> has a bill coming out that uh, is going to require exchanges operating in Texas to provide a plan for greater transparency and proof of reserve to the Texas Department of Banking, which I think is is smart, uh, you know, to fill out the paperwork and you know do the due diligence. I mean. The whole idea behind it at first was that there shouldn't be any regulation because you know there's no no one's coming to the table. But if you know if the the problems happen, then you have to start addressing the problems that you see. Uh, I think that's going to be an interesting one. But how do you pick who you're going to work with as far as a counterparty? Like how do you? Um, I know a lot of people for a transparent asset, it's it's tricky. What what are your thoughts? How do you how did you position? How did you make those choices and those decisions? Um, I think I think it's a fantastic question. I think you're going to start running into a few more issues uh, we have on the docket with the SEC soon um, about qualified custodians for RAs and crypto. And I think that will be an interesting turn. Um, but the rules, if you are a private crypto fund or a private fund in general, are, are a bit different than if you're a hedge fund. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- th- those are important nuances, and we're still sort of Sorting out what those what those nuances are, mm-hmm. H- how we choose counterparties, uh, I would say very selectively, uh, and you do full, full due diligence. This isn't something where I need to get the trade done. I need to get the trade done. Y- you have to anticipate these are twenty four seven markets. Um, we have a 
global network, but we generally don't have people, you know, overlapped awake 24 Mm seven. And so you simply just need to anticipate, uh, you need to understand what you're going to do, what you need to do. Um, if you have to move your fund in an hour, that's a problem. You should have found something that there's, that was the foundation of what you were doing was Mm -hmm. flawed from the start. And so when we choose counterparties, uh, we prefer U.S. ones or U.S. funds, so that that helps. That's not always the case, and there's far more liquidity offshore than there is onshore. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at counterparties, you do the same diligence that you would do as a private equity investor, as a normal hedge fund. You ask them for a balance sheet. If it looks like a balance sheet that a, a certain crypto CEO published, um, you Ex crypto CA, I should say. Uh, you kind of scratch your head and say, why would I lend you money or why would I? And this was the norm. People were just excited mm-hmm. to give money. People talked about, you know, nine figure checks over phone calls. Um, that's not something that you should ever be comfortable with. And mm-hmm. when people are doing something like that, you should ask and say, hey, like, hey, why? Uh, can I see a balance sheet? Can I understand what, what risk I'm taking as, as a counterparty? Um, and and you hold my money overnight. Like, why can't you settle my trade immediately? It's not like the market's closed and you can't settle this. Mm-hmm. And so asking questions, um, there's a little bit of FOMO. People always wanted to get, you know, in a, in a zero interest rate environment, if I could lend them my stable coin at 14%, that was a pretty good deal. Um, <laughs> what I think a lot of crypto participants misconstrued is that you're talking about a fixed income instrument. The, only, the most you can ever get repaid is your money. Um, this isn't an equity instrument where I can go to the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're taking 14% and your downside is 100%. Uh, there's there's really limited upside in that. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. something that people are learning at the moment mm-hmm. um, when they get back claims for 80 cents on the dollar. I mean, it's it's awful. Right. But, but that's a that's a hard lesson that I think we have to learn. Uh, mm-hmm. to, to the point of counterparties, though, we, we try to talk to our counterparties frequently, mm-hmm. understand what's going on, understand the market, and that helps. I mean, some of these markets are so illiquid that you know, if you want to move hundreds of thousands of dollars, like you, you have to use OTC desks and you have to use mm-hmm. prime brokers because there's simply not liquidity in some of these names. If you want to trade, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, yes, there's liquidity as, as much as you need because they trade five, ten billion dollars a day without without fail. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really, really drops off once you go below those names. It becomes mm-hmm. incredibly challenging to find the liquidity that you need and maybe the products that you need. Mm-hmm. And so that that just creates the conversation. It's an excuse for us to call people, talk to our network, understand what's going on, what people are thinking, what people are doing, what inventory people have, um, and understand how they react. I mean, I can tell you that the fastest we'll trade with counterparties once we're on board with them, mm-hmm. maybe two weeks, you know, mm-hmm. spend time understanding how their balance sheet looks, how they process trades, little mm-hmm. test trades, understanding what's going on there. So mm-hmm. um, no, no secret sauce, I would just say kind of common sense due diligence. If you mm-hmm. if you see smoke, there's probably fire below it. I mean, you, some of the balance sheets that we saw summer of 2022, spring of 2022, you would laugh at. It, it wasn't a balance sheet. It mm-hmm. was a few numbers put on a page that didn't tie out and they said, hey, here it is. We sent it to you. <laughs> it's just it remem- uh, it reminds me of my friends who were Nasdaq traders prior to the decimalization system and how it was the fun times boy the money was flowing everyone was having a great time they were screaming you know up oh, Simba they were boy they were having a good time on the trading desks and everyone wanted to be a trader but at that point that was that really was it was just fast money and it was gambling you know there was just like payment for order flow everything you know and I I kind of feel like um, from what I'm hearing, the way you do business, it's more methodical, slower thinking. So crypto doesn't necessarily mean fast trading and, and quant funds. It's it's uh, it sounds like it's a little more than just uh, portfolio institutional like equity portfolio management. We, I would say we in our thought process really resemble more of a concentrated hedge fund than we do anything else. There's this unique opportunity, at least that that we think in crypto, where you have this really, really early stage side of the world where the Andreessen's of the world, the paradigms, the, the early stage investors mm-hmm. have a boatload of money and can throw money at everything. And that's mm-hmm. obviously not their strategy. And they're, they're very effective at what they do. They get mm-hmm. deal flow and they capitalize on that deal flow. Yeah. And then on this other side, you have really, really, really sophisticated quant guys who are market making globally and making a killing. And some of these obvious trades that don't exist in normal markets because you have to go fight, you know, the citadels, the, you know, 0.72s of the world to go find these opportunities actually exist in crypto. Mm-hmm. And so you have these really two heavy-ended 
sides of the market. And we actually try to play in between. There's there's very little in, in terms of the middle market in crypto. This is you know Michael Jordan playing at a high school pickup game. There's uh, <laughs> th- there's there is competition, but there's not a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and right now, I think that's that's where we're best served because when those you know competitors or those incumbents do come into the market, we're going to have five to seven years of experience on them. We understand how it goes. These things aren't simple to set up. They will get easier, mm-hmm. um, but setting up our trading infrastructure it took a year. Um, I, I I can't really comment on how long it would take to set up a, a hedge fund of, of equivalent size outside of the crypto markets. Um, mm-hmm. It would probably require a tad more capital, but mm-hmm. I, I think that, that that's a testament to the time, effort, and energy put into this, where it's, if you're a family office that wants to go do this, you're looking at a an investment of millions of dollars in salary and cost and setup fees and legal fees. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have to find the right people to do it. Yeah, once the you, dating, once you have it the dating up. process of even before that of, of finding the people that you need to to get that advice from, right? That's yeah. a, that's exactly right, and it's it, it's a very nuanced. Um, it's it's a very nuanced market where some of the mm-hmm. traditional white shoe New York law firms are less equipped to do it than some of the the middle market guys because they don't mm-hmm. they don't need to do it. They can go you know deal with the. Uh, Stan Druckenmiller's of the world and and the Soros's of the world that have mm-hmm. tens of billions of dollars and don't care about you know five hundred thousand dollars setup fee for a, an offshore fund where you get mm-hmm. some of the crypto guys and they're a little bit more they have to be a little more cost conscious because they're smaller, mm-hmm. um, but it's it, it's a really really fascinating environment coming from, I guess the advisory side of the world seeing how some of these institutions operate. I mean we dealt with the I don't know, oak trees of the world, the Brookfields of the world. Mm-hmm. We dealt with really, really massive banks, and then seeing how this crypto side of the world operates. And I think you'd be surprised in some areas and really impressed in other areas. That's great. So what uh, if you wanted to tell somebody uh, kind of how they should start if they wanted to do some research into how to get started as uh, someone graduated from high school or college, what would you... What direction would you point if they were interested in the crypto space? Um, Not necessarily what you do, but like if you thought that there was somebody that like, you know, those green fields, what are some of those green fields that you see um, people maybe have overlooked? It's a fantastic question. Um, I, I, for, from, from an application case, mm-hmm. uh, what I really see is, is crypto as a, as a delivery mechanism. Mm-hmm. And so what self-custody provides you is something that's akin to a bank account. Look, you're, if you're in the U.S., that's, that's really not a problem to you. You can walk into most places and go get a bank account. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a problem in different emerging economies. That's a, that's a problem different places in the world. Business accounts are very different. Um, but look at this as a business opportunity where now anybody who has a smartphone on planet Earth could be a possible customer for you. Mm-hmm. Um, those rails are really, really, really unique where you can outsource labor across mm-hmm. the world pretty seamlessly. Mm-hmm. Um, you can access pockets of the world that you never had any ability to do beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, call it maybe like an Etsy on steroids. See yeah. see what you can wh- what you can leverage from where you can leverage it in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we'll start to see a few new paradigms kind of exist. Like, so right right now we're working mostly with companies that are trying to improve existing existing things. So we need to make settlement better. DTCC could be better. I, I don't think anybody would argue with that. We should have weekend settlement. That's something that already exists. Um, think about pitching, hey, do you want to go get in a car with a stranger to drive you somewhere in 1995? <laughs> like, what? But that's commonplace today. And yeah. so these things that are enabled by that is what I think I'm most excited about. Mm-hmm. But we got to get off the ground first. You got to yeah. make the the incremental improvement before you can make the revolutionary improvements. Awesome, great, thanks, thanks for coming out. It was a good conversation started. Love to have you back. Talk about some other general stuff too. Love to do it. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Awesome, yeah, thanks. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this content, you can find me on Money in the Bank with Frank on all of your favorite podcast platforms on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on our YouTube channel. Look forward to bringing you more content like this in the future. Thanks.